January 9th, 20... Oh, sorry about that. Good evening, welcome everyone. This is the January 19th, 2021 Combined City Council Meeting. Uh, Mayor Bob Odekirk presiding. We will start with the invocation by Brother Ed Aaron Bosich from uh, St. John the Baptist Catholic Church, which um, after which he will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Let us pray. Gracious God, in the gift of humility, we ask for a greater awareness of your presence in our daily lives. May we be open to your invitation to love more and to be open to new and life-giving opportunities to bring hope to others. As we begin a new chapter in our history tomorrow, send blessings on our new president and vice president, our country, state, and city. Protect and guide all those who are in authority especially our mayor, his council, our first responders, firefighters, and police officers. Watch over those who grieve the loss of loved ones, especially those who have died of the COVID-19 virus. Let each of us continue to love and support all our essential workers, especially our teachers, dedicated nurses, doctors, and all those who care for the unloved and poor of our society. Lord, make each of us instruments of your love and peace. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> you might stand out of the You know, Mayor, excuse me. Yes. When I was watching this at home, I noticed that a lot of the council members, they don't speak into the mic and you can't hardly understand or hear what they're saying at home. So I think because they're down in front, they need to push it further towards faces so we can hear them. Okay. We'll have that checked. Okay. We begin with roll call. Mayor Odekirk. Here. Councilwoman Gavin. Here. Councilman Hug. Here. Councilman Landy. Here. Councilman Morris. Here. Councilman Mudrin. Here. Councilwoman Coleman. Here. Councilwoman Reardon. Here. Councilman Turk. Here. First on the agenda this evening are introductions. The newly appointed interim police chief, Don Malik, <coughs> and the newly appointed deputy police chiefs, Sherry Blackburn, Robert Brown, and Carlos Matlock. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for having us here tonight. I would like to introduce myself, Don Malik. I was uh, appointed Monday, uh, January 11th, uh, to the position of interim chief. I am absolutely ecstatic uh, to be given this opportunity to be afforded um, the chance to lead one of the, the best police departments there are. Um, I will keep this short. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to build bridges, uh, build relationships, and uh, get to work with each and every one of you. Thank you. I will uh, turn it over to Deputy Chief Brown. Thank you. Good evening. As Deputy Chief Brown, um, I know some of you here, um, some I don't know, but I will, I'm pretty sure I'm going to know you soon. Um, I'm excited. 
I'm excited for this opportunity. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Been on this department 20 years. I've seen different chiefs. I've seen different ways of doing things. Um, I'm going to bring my own unique way of doing things where I'm going to work with the community. We're talking about building bridges, as the chief said. I'm in charge of operation, so I have a lot to do. The community that I have to go out and talk to people, ensure, let them know that they were, we're there for them. We're planning on working with them. Uh, we're planning on opening up the police department to them. Because right now, um, there's a lot going on. 2020 was a bad year. Because of that, we haven't been able to do Citizen Police Academy. We haven't been able to go to a lot of community meetings or anything like that. So I know, and with the, the George Floyd case, there's a lot going on. So we want to just ensure and let them know that we are still here for them. We are going to work with them and we hear their concerns. And it's our concerns too. As far as the police department and the officers, we have to get back to procedural justice. We have to give them a voice in the police department. Let them know that we're there for them as we're there for the city. We can do both things together. And that's all I have to say for now and uh, more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sherry Blackburn. Uh, I'm going to be the Deputy Chief of Administration. I will be overseeing internal affairs, personnel, uh, and field training. Probably the most important and the one part of this uh, new new uh, job that I'm taking on is is with the recruitment that we have going on. Um, I've been a field training coordinator and part of the field training program for over 10, 12 years now. Uh, it's so incredibly important that we are getting members, community members from the city that we that we have. Uh, we want to mirror, our department wants to mirror the public that we serve. Uh, so I'm very excited to be a part of that. Uh, it's extremely important. Like Deputy Chief Brown had said, with COVID hitting, uh, hiring has kind of been in a freeze right now. Training has kind of stopped. So that's going to be part of what my responsibility and my duties are, are to ensure that our officers are properly being trained, uh, being supported, uh, and they're being just heard within the department. Continue with bridging those, bridging not only the relationships we have within the department, that's going to transfer into the to the community that we serve. So I'm extremely excited. Um, looking forward. Only day two. Um, so bear with us. There'll be a little bit in the transition, um, but we're going to get through this. Um, there's going to be more to come, like Rob said. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Manager, Council. Glad to be here tonight. I'm humbled to um, have been awarded this opportunity for this position. Uh, I've been here at the police department for over 27 years. Throughout my uh, police career, I've worked in various capacities within the police department. I spent over 20 years as a detective in investigations, which now I'm the deputy chief of investigations. Uh, one of the things that I've focused on, and um, most of you know that I'm very much community oriented. I'm always in the community doing something with different organizations. I'm a member of a lot of organizations within this community, and I look forward to working with the council here, giving back to the community, opening up the doors of the police department to the community, and you know making some changes in a positive way to take the uh, scar off the police department that we've, um, well, most police departments in this country, we've have this bad reputation at this time and we're hoping to turn the Joliet Police Department into um, you know, a um, unique place to work here. I look forward to working with each and every one of you guys and ladies and yeah, that's it. <laughs> I stand on forever. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for having me. And again, I'm humbled to, um, I'm humbled to be afforded this opportunity to um, take this challenge on. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor? Yes. They, um, the, 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 all four of them uh, said excited. So I'm going to join that with them in their excitement for their new position because I'm pretty excited about this new command staff. Next on the agenda, we have representatives from We Are The Community to say a few words. Good 
Good evening, Mayor and Councilman. Uh, we are here with the We Are the Community Organization. Um, this is our fourth annual Three Kings Day event. It's customary in the Hispanic community to give out gifts on Three Kings Day. So our plan was to give 100 kids from the community gifts. And with the businesses here, we had over 20 plus businesses. Uh, it's an organization with Mr. Brian Deli and Magdaleno Barragan from Barragan Security. Um, we were able to give out 250 gifts plus. We had free food. Uh, the mayor was there. We handed out some gifts to the mayor. We had a good time. We were able to keep everything uh, uh, controlled with the guidelines with, for COVID. You know, everything ran smoothly. So we're here to give a certificate of appreciation for coming out to the mayor. Thank you so much for supporting, you know, the Hispanic community. And hopefully next year, and give out some more gifts. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, I was there that Sunday, and um, I really give you credit. There aren't a lot of people doing those types of things because of COVID, but Supermercado, you ran it correctly. Um, the, the crowd was controlled. It was it was monitored the right way. It was great to see community coming together. I, I hope in the near future there could be more of this in Joliet. But thank you for what you guys did, all the free meals you gave out, and all the the, the young people that got to have a fun day. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the support. All thank right. you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for support for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as written? Is there a second? Yes, In motion and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Coleman? <coughs> Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Next is citizens to be heard on agenda items. There is no one here that would like to speak on an agenda item unless there are questions during their item. Um, we do have one person who did register to be called to speak, and that person is John Sheridan. He can be put through on the line. John, John, you, your four minutes will begin now. You can begin speaking. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. <clears throat> I'm calling it night in regards to this Lambridge request for a bailout. I want to remind the city council this is the same organization that misled the city council and taxpayers back in Joliet, up in Joliet back in 2019. They told us on numerous occasions naming rights agreement would had a confidentiality clause and they could not share the details with the council or the taxpayers in Joliet. Then when the Illinois Attorney General said that they had to release it to the city, they still refused to comply. It wasn't until the Herald News filed a lawsuit that they finally released it. Guess what? There was no confidentiality clause, and the mayor did indeed sign a document. I cannot believe the slammers had a total disregard for the ordinance and ruling on the Illinois Attorney General to turn over the naming rights document. Tonight, they are now before the city council requesting a bailout for $79,000 that is owed to the city from, from 2020, in addition to a bailout for 2021. There is also expense for the cost of repairs to the stadium needs to be fixed in 2021 before the stadium can open. How do we really need, how do we really know they need a bailout? Are their numbers correct? Does this story fit the same category as the confidentiality agreement? When he presented the year end results and projections for 2021, I didn't hear anything about how they plan to cut their salaries or expenses to help themselves out first before asking for a handout. When COVID first hit, the city was prepared to do whatever is needed to do to balance the budget, including cutting salaries if necessary. Basically, everything was on the table. Right now in Joliet, we have people that cannot meet, meet the basic needs of uh, their life, which is food, shelter, and clothing. Does anybody even think about helping our own taxpayers before bailing out businesses? <clears throat> they are not the only ones in the city of Joliet that is losing money or had to close their doors because of COVID. If you bail out the slammers, be prepared to help all the failing businesses in Joliet that have been profitable before COVID. 
The city built the ballpark for $27 million in 2002, and they haven't made a dime in profit since the opening. Over the years, the city has sunk additional millions of dollars into the ballpark. So I wouldn't brag about being a good business for the city with 18 years of mismanagement. In addition, state and committee and the city council should look at a way to dump the losing money pit. 18 years is long enough. Several of you are on the council are business people. Would any of you run your business for 18 years and make no profit? I doubt it. So why use my tax dollars to do it? Stop kicking a can down the road. You have a fiduciary responsibility to look at this situation and cut the city losses. You certainly would do the same evaluation for your personal businesses. In, fact, in light of recent budget cuts, I would respectfully ask the city council deny the request to waive the slammer's obligation to pay full rent, utility, and withholding naming rights money. The coronavirus pandemic is pushing America into a mental health crisis. Please take care of the taxpayers that are in dire need of food, shelter, and clothing first. On another agenda item, the reclassification of lots on Broadway and Ingalls. Can you add the entrance to Ingalls Avenue for traffic flow and safety? In the last couple of years, we've had over 20 accidents at that intersection. <coughs> And I'd like to thank Mr. Hansen for working with Cunningham Neighborhood Council in getting our issues resolved. And thank you all for your time. Have a good night. Thank you. That is the only one who registered to be called to speak this evening. I will just ask, because we do have quite a few people on the other side, is there anyone that would like to speak on an agenda item before we move on? Seeing none. Next on the agenda this evening are council committee reports. First is finance committee report. The uh, finance committee comprised of Councilwoman Reardon, Councilman Mudger and myself met at 530 here in the council chambers to review the following items. Uh, first thing on the agenda was approval of payments for emergency repairs of the city owned building at 141 East Jefferson Street, which is the building that was uh, uh, hit by the uh, the high winds this uh, fall uh, in the sun, in the uh, right field section of the of the uh, slammers field. Uh, the re repairs were all covered by insurance, and we just had to approve them. Uh, res resolution to approve cash payments in lieu of related related to health care benefits. IMRF passed the uh, uh, some different rules about um, uh, having uh, IMRF cash payments for. Uh, people who decline health insurance to become part of their uh, their credible earnings, reportable earnings, so that uh, we have to pass an ordinance in order to comply with IMRF. Um, we re reviewed the monthly financial reports, personnel summaries, travel expense report, invoices paid, found them all to be in order, recommend their approval, and uh, unless uh, Pat or Sherry has anything to add, um, that's our report. Public Service Committee report. The Public Service met this afternoon at 4.30 here in the City Council Chambers. On the committee in, in attendance was Councilwoman Gavin, Councilman Morris, and myself. Also in attendance was <laughs> a Director of Utilities, Allison Swisher, Director, soon to be retiring Director of Public Works, um, Jim Trisna, and soon to be a director, the new director of public works, Greg Ruddy. Pretty routine and short agenda. We had four items on the contracts that were all related to the water and sewer department. Two had to do with the Auk Sable wastewater treatment plant on the far west side there, which uh, needed some uh, improvements and upgrades as it ages. We went through all four contracts. As we did with the three change orders passed and final payments, Again, they were, uh, there was some that were closing out 2019 contracts for resurfacing from the public works side and some from the public, you know, uh, one from the public utility side. And under ordinances and resolutions, um, maybe we can take note that there's, uh, we did a, a recommend approval of an ordinance establishing a special services area one and two for the um, <coughs> upcoming 
improvements uh, for the, the, those particular streets. And I'm here. That would be um, those areas. Do you remember the areas, Betty and, and Terry? Yes, we've got uh, the hardwood, the hardwood area. Uh, we have a special uh, special service and the Security Avenue. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And so you know, like this is routine. Whenever we do the. Um, not just resurfacing, but the actual reconstruction, you know, and there's, these are areas that don't currently have curbs and gutters. So the curbs and gutters will be added and there is a participation uh, charged fee charged to each resident. Um, essentially, if you're, if you're in a single family residence or up to a three or four unit residence that you live in, it's $300 per residence, um, which pays for not only the road reconstruction, but the installation of um, curbs and gutters. So it's pretty routine, but I wanted to point that out and let those folks know that they've got curbs and gutters and, and brand new streets coming to their neighborhood soon. Other than it was pretty routine, we went through the entire agenda and all items were unanimously voted on to be recommended to, to the full council here for approval. Did I miss anything or anything you would like to add? No, I think that's All right, then that would be my report, Mayor. Thank you. Stadium committee report. Stadium committee we met last Tuesday, January 12th at 4.30. On the committee is Mike Turk, Jan Quillman, and myself. The purpose for the meeting was twofold. Uh, the first was a year in review. They presented to us a slide presentation of about 30, 40 pages, which I see on the screen, but we're not going to show that, are we? They presented a condensed version for okay. us this evening. Do you, you want to we can start that up then? <clears throat> hey, Nick. Uh, Nick, is it, it, Nick is here. That's it. You're, you're fine. You should, you should be here. Okay. Hi, everybody. I know most of you, but I know there's a few uh, a few council members that are new since uh, I was last here. I'm Nick Samaka. I'm the majority owner of the Slammers. Is this okay if I take this off? Yes. Yes. Might be able to hear a little better. Um, so as Pat said, we uh, met with the stadium committee last week. Uh, we've created a much thinner packet. Just to uh, give you an update on uh, what we did last year, what 2021 is looking, looking like, and also um, make an ask at the end. Uh, so if we could, okay. Just point it towards there we go. So the only way I could describe 2020 is it was a crazy year, as you could imagine. Uh, our league suspended our the season uh, in late June. We committed to trying to play. And so we worked with the Illinois Department of Public Health to get permission to play. And we created our own four-team league called the City of Champions Club. We recruited 124 players from around the country, and we had the best collection of talent uh, to play professional baseball that's ever been seen in Joliet. And we implemented a wide range of operational changes, as you, one can imagine, uh, to protect against COVID. Everything from creating a cashless environment to a grab and go concessions. And we've worked very hard to try to keep our fans, our, our employees, and our uh, players safe. And I got to say, by many measures, uh, in our book, this season was a terrific success. We were only one of two cities in the entire state, Rosemont being the other, to host professional sports with fans in the stands in the last nine months of 2020. Not Chicago, not any other city, Rosemont and Joliet. We received a ton of press coverage from around the United States. Joliet was in the news for what our players and what our, we were able to do consistently, national as well as, uh, as well as local media. Our total COVID cases, players, coaches, staff, fans, anybody that showed up in the stadium was zero. And we're very proud of that. We preserved over 170 jobs by playing this past season. 
Uh, we, it obviously was a very difficult economic environment and we're happy to have made uh, that contribution. It gave us an opportunity to strengthen relationships with MLB teams, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Major League Baseball and the new partnership that we have become a part of with them. We helped drive traffic to local businesses who were also uh, hurting an awful lot uh, last summer. The fans that came out loved the experience. They loved the ability to come out and enjoy a little bit of reality, even though they were socially distanced and even though they had to order their food online and all the other things. And we had uh, four former major league players and we had four former major league player managers that participated. So we got a little bit of a, a little bit of the red carpet treatment too. I talked about, uh, or I mentioned the press coverage, but you know, the eyes of the baseball world were on Joliet. And we were on national public radio uh, on one of their national broadcasts with uh, Scott Simon. We got coverage on ESPN. We got coverage uh, also from newspapers and radio stations around the country because, you know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be, uh, trying to brag, but what we did was pretty unique last year. And we got a lot of attention for it and the city got a lot of attention for it. And I think that's a good thing. I'm, uh, we're not gonna play a video, there we go. I talked about local business. Here's just some uh, quotes from two people, Chris Greenwood at Posh Hospitality. Um, we brought, he told us, he brought, we brought in over $50,000 in room revenue to uh, his business. And we, there are hotel rooms booked at other hotels in the, in the city as well. Uh, Vince from Migraine, uh, and we had fans coming out and staying out after the ball game to go to migraine. It helped those guys out a lot. It was, a, you know, they had, a tough, they had a tough summer too. So we feel good about the impact that we were able to have on the local community as a result. I said it was mostly good news, but it wasn't all good news. Uh, we really struggled with attendance. And there's a number of different factors. Uh, we think economic stress in the community, right? A lot of people uh, were facing economic stress personally. Uh, there is fear of the virus. Even people who felt comfortable coming out to the games, if you were in a company or you were sponsoring a group, you were reticent to, in essence, endorse us to say, let's have a company outing. So our group business, which is usually a third to 40% of our business, just totally disappeared. Uh, I talked about our, you know, we got some good local media support, but it's a little strange when uh, the New York City media covered us more than some of the outlets in Joliet. And the buzz, you know, our revenue was down over 60% and we lost about $365,000. So it was, not a, it was not pretty from a financial standpoint. We're glad we did it. We, we think the other benefits were, were good for the city and they were good for uh, our relationships with Major League Baseball, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, but you know, it, wasn't a, it wasn't the greatest uh, year, like I said, from a bottom line standpoint. 2021 uh, is gonna be different, I guarantee that. Uh, if I could predict it, though, uh, I'd probably be lying. You know, the, the good news is our league has been designated as an official partner league of Major League Baseball. I think this is something that could be a huge deal for us again. Uh, <clears throat> there's talk about us participating in the MLB draft. There's certainly talk uh, about doing joint marketing deals, and we're in the process of flushing out the details with MLB right now. But at the same time, MLB took a big ax to the minor league system. 43 teams uh, lost their professional baseball team, and including the Kane County Cougars, which are not too far away from here. So 2021, Joliet is gonna have a professional baseball. Uh, Geneva and Kane County may not, because their future, I think, is still uncertain. But we have uncertainty too. Uh, <coughs> The virus continues to ravage our society, our economy, and 
We're not sure yet. We're planning on playing as a league, uh, but we're still trying to figure out and do some contingency planning about what 2021 is going to look like. When are fans going to be ready to come back? Uh, obviously, when uh, we've all got vaccines, we're going to feel great, but who knows when that's going to happen. Uh, how quickly will the economy rebound? When it rebounds, it's going to be good for everybody, but I don't know when that's going to happen. And maybe, you know, we need to be thinking about what we did last year, which is a modified league. And yet we have the backdrop of the attendance issues and the, and the financial issues. So we're, there's still a lot of uncertainty facing us going forward, which, uh, which just creates uh, a lot of stress. So I am, I am coming here uh, with an ask. Um, and the ask is a simple one, which is to move from a fixed rent to a variable rent. Uh, there's a lot of municipalities that we just highlighted three on this page, uh, Schaumburg and both Madison and Green Bay, Wisconsin, which have either eliminated their rent totally for two years or cut it back significantly as they did in Schaumburg. Um, our current rent, uh, given that we've had this de decrease in revenue, is a huge is a huge burden. In 2019, our our total rent, our base rent, and our additional uh, rent from the naming rights was six percent of revenue. 2020 was 16 percent of revenue. And so, we're coming to ask that uh, instead of sticking to the fixed formula, which is just putting an additional burden on top of our stressed finances, that we variableize it and apply the 6% that we had in 2019 to 2020 and use the same formula next year, in or, or I guess this year in 2021. It would be a big help to the ball club. That's all I've got. Uh, Questions? So in your packet, we have uh, a couple of pages from Chris Regis discussing um, where the history is and where we're at. Uh, Sabrina, I'm, because this is not a specific agenda item, this is something we cannot vote on, can vote on? How would this? Warren, can you step up then? So you cannot vote on it this evening. What we can do is if there's a consensus to move forward with the modification, we can bring back an amendment to the lease um, at the next city council meeting for a vote on that. Okay. Um, as requested then, does anybody have questions uh, for Nick? Did uh, you get a chance to look at uh, what was put together in your packet um, that the request is for 6% of <coughs> the cost would be 6% of the, of the total revenue for the slammers. Well, what is, what is the fixed rent now and for how many months out of the year? Is well, there a the, fixed rent now? The uh, fixed rent in total rate? is, I'm sorry, I have this in here, 116,560 basically. That's for the whole year? Yeah. Nick, sorry, if I might. Just yes. to, I'm sorry, did I cut somebody off? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in your planning for the 2021 season, and I saw you go through all your bullet points, is there, I did you, talk about anything that the uh, that the ball club could do to cut some expenses or have you looked at that so uh, we cut expenses last year uh, we cut salaries we uh, in our off season have cut our staff down to four people um, and we are delaying our hiring till we have more certainty so we have been cutting we cut uh, and we cut this year as well uh, Betty in the season, obviously, when uh, when we're playing, we have players, we have coaches, we got to pay. We have to pay the staff for the for the uh, 
to do concessions uh, and you know ushers and things of that sort. But now we've cut back to basically bare bones yeah, minimum. We have Tom, our operations guy, Heather, our general manager. We've got Lauren, uh, who is uh, our group person, and our and our uh, she also does a lot of additional events. So when, for example, a high school team wants to come in or a college team and they want to rent the stadium. Uh, and then uh, we've got John Wilson, who I think a lot of you guys know, who is our corporate guy. That's all we've got. Um, and I know Pat asked this question, so I want to reiterate it. So somebody like Lauren, for example, who, you know, this week, this weekend, we literally had a dog sniffing competition in our stadium, believe it or not. I didn't even know these things existed. <laughs> but our proposal is it's 6% of everything, just like the 6% came from 2019 mm -hmm. of everything. So we have cut back what we think is to the bare bones. We're out there trying to sign sponsorships and trying to get, um, you know, tickets are a little difficult because we can't produce a schedule without understanding whether we're going to play. But we're out there doing everything we can uh, to try to keep the ship afloat, basically. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Mr. Mudroom? Yes. I'm not seeing what you're talking about in your packet. I don't have anything. I have nothing on my uh, iPad. On, on our laptop, it is under stadium. Under stadium? Under stadium. Maybe that's why I'm not. Okay. Paper, there's a paper clip. Let me keep looking there. I didn't look. Under council comments? Or, no, I mean uh, committee? No, under, under the. Uh, oh, uh, under the report. meeting? Yes. Yes, under appointments and then council. Committee reports um, under the stadium heading. Okay. There is a, a paper clip that shows we have. Uh, okay, I was looking for uh, actual paper. So. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. So the rent reduction you're looking for is there's a flat six percent of whatever you take in. Yes. So that'd be variable from month to month, week to week, day to day. So. We wouldn't be, we, uh, we wouldn't do it month to month, and, I'll, and let me explain why. Last year, we sold a lot of sponsorships, group uh, business uh, in, up until March. And we wound up writing a lot of refund checks last year. Uh, and so if somebody, if, if somebody booked a group or a sponsorship and then they canceled it, then we'd be come back. So we would propose to pay it just at the end, reconcile at the end of the year and make one lump sum pay so that it's clean because last year we had money coming in money going out so that's what we're what we're suggesting mayor yes did you last year and what is the projection this year did, did you benefit at all from any COVID relief for pay payroll we uh we have uh, benefited from some COVID relief uh, we've got we got a small business loan. Uh, we got a PPP loan that we have not yet uh, we have not yet had received forgiveness. Uh, we got a grant from Will County, and we got a grant from the state. Yes. And with all that, you still lost three sixty five. Yes. Even if the loan for even if the PPP is forgiven, you'll still lose three sixty five. If the PPP were forgiven, that would that would cut that loss. Yes. To what, sir? Uh, the PPP. Uh, don't quote me on it, but it was about uh, 150. Okay. So it would cut it somewhat. Yes. Thank you, sir. You know, along those lines, Nick, um, I think one of the requirements for PPP was that you wouldn't lay off employees. Um, yes. Uh, there was also a thing that said basically if you were if your business was ex uh, affected by COVID related restrictions, so the biggest restriction in our business is social is social distancing, because it can't you know so what when we worked with IDPH our maximum capacity was 880 a game, 20 percent, so that allowed us to uh, to apply. And is there any use for the stadium besides baseball? Is there any any other use during the year? So uh, we had reached an agreement with a <coughs> new uh, women's semi-professional soccer team last year. Uh, they canceled because of COVID. Um, we have done 
other soccer events um, as well. We do a lot with uh, amateur baseball, with traveling teams, with uh, the University of St. Francis. You know, they canceled half of their season last year as well. Uh, so we're looking, we're looking to do anything we can in that stadium. Uh, my dream would be to fill it 365 days a year. We did kickball. Uh, we had a, we created our own uh, mini amateur college league back. We didn't have fans in it, but uh, college kids who couldn't play in their university programs came to us. They paid a fee to play. We did that in uh, the May, June timeframe. We're looking every single day for anything we can do. Every single day. Normal season is from when to when? Normal season for the Frontier League is middle of May till the first, uh, till Labor Day, basically the day before Labor Day. So, you know, the trap, when the weather starts looking good is when the travel teams start to come, when universities start to come. We'll get a little bit of that business in the fall and then it, it drops off October, November ish. Thank you, sir. So last year we, we did modify the lease. I remember we divided it up by the normal number of games and then said we would multiply it by the actual games you played. So what would be the difference in rent by using the modified version we came up with last year for last year's rent? So we never did, just to clarify later, we never did, we came with that proposal and then uh, because that's when we thought we might play a league season that was shortened, but it was never it, it was never adopted, so we didn't modify anything. But under that proposal, uh, our, our rent probably would have gone up. We played a bunch of games. The issue was nobody came home. Uh, so it, 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 it wasn't that, the, you know, we cr in our City of Champions Cup, since we had four teams all playing out of the same stadium, we're playing just about every day. My staff was getting a little tired of coming in every day, like road trips sometimes for a rest. So I think, Larry, the reality is if, if we adopted the old proposal, our rent would probably have gone up. But we never did actually, you guys never voted on it. We, we, when we decided to do this league, we said, Let, let's just come back and revisit it at the end of the year, was the thought. Any other questions? Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Anything else, Pat? Nothing. Oh, Scott, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Bob. Um, <clears throat> and at the end of the meeting, we had Bob Navarro, who is the Heritage Corridor representative, who represents uh, us to the IHSA. The IHSA had notified him that our contract was running out with the high school tournament. We had no state tournament last year, and the projection is there'll be no st state final tournament this year. So he is back to them, um, bringing back then the contract to extend this, or bringing it to us, the, the council, if we want to extend it two more years. But in his understanding from the State High School Association, there may be some baseball played, but there is no plans for a final state tournament, just like they did with a number of other sports that they had some regional games. And that's my report. Thank you. I just have another report. Agenda? Under consent agenda, approval of the minutes. It's recommended the minutes of the pre-council meeting held on December 14th, the minutes of the council meeting held on December 15th, 2020, the minutes of the pre-council meeting held on January 4th, 2021, the minutes of the council meeting held on January 5th, 2021, and the minutes of the special council meeting held on January 8th, 2021, stand approved. Is there a motion to approve said consent agenda items? So moved. Second. And seconded to approve. Councilman Hug. Aye. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. 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 
Aye. Councilman Turk. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. I'll try this one if I have issues, then I'll move. Okay. Thank you. Or any up here on the dais. Okay, else. thank you. Next under ordinances. Council memo 40-21 ordinances associated with the West Side Joliet Real Estate LLC subdivision. This includes an ordinance approving a preliminary plat of West Side Joliet Real Estate LLC subdivision an ordinance approving a final plat of West Side Joliet Real Estate LLC subdivision unit one, an ordinance approving a recording <coughs> plat of West Side Joliet Real Estate LLC subdivision unit one, and an ordinance approving a special use permit to allow a self storage facility that includes indoor climate controlled and outdoor mini storage units in a B3 general business zoning district located at 2100 Essington Road. Staff is recommending these ordinances be adopted. So moved. Second. Question. Yes. Who's here from planning to answer the questions? Jim Torrey is here this evening. Come on in, Jim. Your Does the microphone work, work at the... Now, Jim, just so you know, of course, I've talked to quite a few of my fellow residents from the district. And you're, you, you, we're looking at, but it's un undefined, right? We're looking at a strip mall in front of the storage. That's right. And most likely uh, maybe a fast food restaurant. So the storage will not abut to Essington. No, it will not. Okay. Now, the level of, if you will, quality of the storage units and coming to this uh, agreement with the developer, how does it compare to the level of quality of the existing storage unit right next to it? You know, so what they've given us um, is a conceptual plan of their architectural drawings. Uh, we have conditioned all their approvals that they need to meet our non-residential design standards. So those will meet the quality of construction of the adjacent storage facility. So if they comply with those, with that ordinance for design standards, they have to build with brick product for um, the majority of their material. They can use only a small amount of uh, other material for, you know, um, detailing and so forth that might be uh, an EFIS product or, or something along those lines, but the majority of it should be brick. And in, with the residents I talk to, frankly, they're cautiously okay with it, which is good news for us. They are concerned about, some of we're concerned about, is there any precedent to be set or any attempt to be apparent of turning it in that entire open field into storage? No, they do not have the correct zoning to apply um, in order to do so. You know, they would have to come back to the plan commission and city council to uh, change the zoning and to... From residential to... To commercial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to have commercial zoning and then on top of that, the special use permit uh, in order to do the uh, mini storage or self-storage use. And... The lighting restrictions, directional lighting and such as it pertains to the to the residents that will be uh, uh, abutting to that, correct? Yes. Uh, you know, so we have a, a code in our ordinance that requires only light to reflect down. You can't have light to transfer trans um, to leave your property onto another property or shine into that. We've added an additional condition uh, to the special use ordinance. It doesn't allow an overabundance of internal lighting. Uh, some self-storage facilities uh, can maybe get out of hand with lighting up their building so it glows, you know, to, to attract business. We put a, a condition in there that, you know, wouldn't allow for such a thing. All right, thank you. Okay. I do have a question. Yes, Jim. Jim, about the, about the lighting, you said it goes down. But I've seen some of the lightings out there, particularly over there where the Toyota dealer used to be on uh, Larkin. 
Those mm -hmm. lights go down, but they are so bright. The neighbors behind it, it's like daylight in their backyard. So are we putting a condition on how bright those lights can be, even though they shine down? Um, we do not have a condition currently in there for that, but we have that nuisance language in the ordinance where if they did have lighting that was considered a nuisance, then we can repeal their special use permit request um, or bring them in for a hearing and, and have them uh, adjust the lighting. Well, can't we make that a condition tonight? Sorry, in there, but I mean, well, okay. I mean, I just would think that you wanted to give them a heads up about the lighting before they go and do it. And then we have to come back and do it a public nuisance thing. That's my concern. Yeah, I, we've talked to them about it. So they, there should not be a misunderstanding on, on lighting this business. Okay. Also, uh, well, there, there's a height restriction on any pole lighting, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, the height restriction. You know, I think it's 25 feet, but okay. don't quote me on that. Um, that a different uh, department reviews the lighting. I can find out that information for you and get it to you, but I believe it's 25 feet. Well, it's by ordinance, right? Uh, it's by precedent, the way I understand it, uh, through our public works department that, you know, they, were, they went to adopt some ordinances and uh, they were never approved, but there's standards that they have that they follow. Engineering. And referring to the car dealership that the councilwoman wisely pointed out, because that was that was like Mars. Yeah. I can see it from my house. But those were much taller than 25 feet, I believe, weren't they? Were they not the old Nissan Toyota? They could have been. Yeah, I don't know offhand. They are. I know the 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 right the light problem that you're referring to there. Um, they wanted people to be able to see their product at night in order to sell cars. They should not have that same issue here. You know, they're not selling storage storage units or anything like that. So it's just in order to provide uh, ample parking for, for, or ample lighting for people to park and access their, their storage facilities, you know, at those times of dark darkness. So once they install the lighting, should there be and there may not be, and hopefully not. What would be the process for a resident who lives nearby? Because this is, you know, abutting right to several. If they may, if if they felt like there was a nuisance and light tra trespassing, you know, they could make a complaint like anybody could, or, you know, um, contact the planning division or in engineering division, and we can we can review the situation. We would go out there and physically look at it. Yes determine mm -hmm. that there is, as you call it, light trespass, in which case the developer or owner of, of that uh, facility. Now, all of these restrictions and agreements transfer or travel with the sale? Yes, those are conditions of the ordinance, so those don't ever change. You know, Mayor? Yes. I, Mr. Hanson, you're the attorney here, aren't you? Yes, I am. Would your client have a problem with this lighting issue? No, sir. Or no, no sir. ma'am, excuse Thank you. me. <laughs> No, we're, we're, if if, uh, if Jim indicates that the standard has been is twenty five feet, we'll be happy to make that a condition. Uh, I'm know. just talking about the brightness of the lights, since it does butt up to some of those residential areas. Uh, we have no problem with the brightness of the lights because in today's world, you don't have the situations for a facility like this that you had at the Toyota dealership on Larkin Avenue. So, you know, we and and Mr. Torrey's presentation was right on the money. We've ex, we've gone over everything. They've explained it to us. We're following all the rules and regulations the city has right now. At, not asking for any waivers or variations. So we're going to work with the city and make sure the residents are happy. That's all I wanted to hear. Thank right. you. Now we have it on record. It's always difficult when you're putting a seam of residential to commercial. Yes. It comes a seam. Any other questions? No, thank you. Thank is, you. There a is there a motion to approve Council Memo 40-21 ordinances associated with Westside Joliet Real Estate LLC subdivision? This includes an ordinance approving a preliminary plat, an ordinance approving a final plat, an ordinance approving a recording plat of Westside Joliet Real Estate LLC subdivision unit one and an ordinance approving a special use permit to allow a self-storage facility that includes indoor climate controlled and outdoor mini storage units in a B3 general business zoning district 
located at 2100 Essington Road. Quick question. I thought we already had a motion in a second. And then after that was done, I said I have a question. I apologize, I was moving. Didn't we have that? Yes. Yes. I made the motion. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we have no, it clear. I, I want to make sure the record's correct. And who seconded it? Mike made the motion, I made right? it, Betty seconded it. And Betty seconded it. Okay, Poor Krista. This has been a terrible night with the microphones and moving around. Krista, blame it on COVID. Oh, oh. I was in the middle of the move, so I apologize for that. I didn't mean that. I just, no, I appreciate you correcting me. It's motion and seconded to approve. Councilman Landy? Yes. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Motion carried. Moving on to Council Memo 41-21, which is an ordinance approving the reclassification of 0.45 acres located at 1127 to 1131 North Broadway Street from R2 single family residential zoning to B3 general business zoning. It's recommended said ordinance be adapted. So moved. Second. Question. Yes. Um, can we consider restricting traffic from the proposed office complex onto Ingalls only? And the reason I bring this up is I have people contact me. I'm sure some of you others. I did as well. Um, is because apparently there's also a proposal for up the, up the street, up Broadway, for an existing tire slash service station that's going to start doing semi-tires. Um, and I just kind of agree with the residents that called that uh, restricting, since his office is not even retail, um, I don't think with necessarily more ins and outs, egresses and ingresses on Broadway, especially with future development like semi you know, service would be wise. Is there any way we can do that? Mike? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Councilman Hug. The answer, in my opinion, is no, because Illinois State uh, Department of Transportation regulates that ingress and egress because it's a state highway. So they're the ones who decide, not the city of Joliet uh, in that situation. So I don't even know if we're going to get going to get that uh, ing ingress and egress. I highly doubt it, to be very honest with you. That's been my experience. But the 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 um, developer or the the owner of the property could agree as poor, uh, as part of our agreement to say we're not going to go to the state for that ingress egress. Correct. Could agree. Yes. Okay. So that that my question would still stand then probably. I, you probably can't answer for him, but would he be willing to do that, or he or she? I, th I think from a traffic standpoint, it, it, it seems to make sense to have two uh, ingresses and egresses. And I don't, uh, it, it seems to me that for an office use like this, it would benefit everybody if you did have the two ingresses and egresses. However, like I said earlier, my private opinion, have to, done this for a substantially long period of time, I don't think IDOT's going to approve ingress and Negress that close to Ingalls Avenue myself on 50 on a, on a heavily traveled thoroughfare like 53. Any other questions? It's in motion and seconded to approve Council Memo 41 21, which is an ordinance approving the reclassification of 0.45 acres located 1127 1131 North Broadway Street from R2 single family residential zoning to B3 general business zoning. I would make a motion to table to give us time to see what the owner would say. I'll second. It's been motion and seconded to table Council Memo 41 21. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 41 21 was tabled. Can you check, Mike, with your client? Yeah, well, I have to, right? Yes. <laughs> I was being polite. Okay. Next is Council Memo 42-21, an ordinance approving a variation of use to allow telecation antennas and support equipment, a B3 general business use, 
in an R3 1 and 2 family residential zoning district located at 510 Columbia Street and an ordinance approving a special use permit to allow telecommunication antennas and support equipment located at 510 Columbia Street. It's recommended said ordinances be adopted. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Quillman. I will vote aye because I did not receive any complaints on this. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Turk. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Landy. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Motion carried. Next is Council Memo 43-21, ordinances proposing the establishment of the 2021 Special Service Areas Number 1 and 2. It's recommended said ordinances be adopted. So moved. The second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Quillman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Turk. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Landy. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 44-21, ordinances associated with Timber Oaks Unit 3 subdivision. This includes an ordinance approving the preliminary planned unit development for Timber Oaks Unit 3 and an ordinance approving the reclassification of six acres at the southeast corner of Timber Ridge Court and Southeast Frontage Road from B3 General Business and I1 Light Industrial to R4 Low Density Multifamily Residential Zoning and an ordinance approving the vacation of a 10-foot sanitary sewer easement, a 10-foot stormwater detention easement, and a 15-foot drainage and utility easement located at the southeast corner of Timber Ridge Court and South East Frontage Road. It's recommended said ordinances be adopted. Mayor. Yes. I have talked to Jim Torrey about this, and again, this has been a problem with Timber Oaks and Mr. Maddox. And Cynthia San Miguel called me today. She tried to call Krista to get on the agenda to call in, but I guess since yesterday was a holiday, it's a 24 hour period for calling, so she was denied. So what she did, call me, sent me this email on her comments on this, and um, I'd like to read it to you. Sure. She says, I wanted to call, but the city council and I told me that the, the option was down this morning. My name is Cynthia Hamilton and I live in Timber Oak subdivision and have been an owner since 2015. My neighbors and I have had issues with Mr. Maddox in the past. If I knew then what I know now, I would not have bought this property inside of Timber Oaks. We've had issues of construction, including parking, debris, flat tires, and I even had my power stolen outside of my condo from a subcontractor who plugged a piece of their equipment into my outlet. I know Mr. Maddox is proposing apartments outside of Timber Oak subdivision on Frontage Road. Ed did make a presentation at a November 20th HOA meeting that was held via Zoom. However, many of the neighbors do not, did not attend because of the older crowd, senior citizens who are not too computer or tech savvy. Also, it was right before the Thanksgiving holiday. We had a total of nine residents on the Zoom meeting and on the call, no one had objections. However, we had asked Mr. Maddox to send all the neighbors via USPS mail since they could not attend the Zoom meeting to get their uh, concerns if they had any or their support. And my concern is the construction traffic parking, especially with the proposed apartment being right near the main entrance and exit of Timber Oaks. Thank you all for your time. So I'm going to ask for a table until Mr. Maddox sends an email out to these neighbors and addresses the issue with all the construction debris because there were, that's been an ongoing problem with this development for the last five years. And I did discuss it with Councilman Terry Morris, who it's his district. Did you make a motion? I make a motion to table. I'll second. It's been motion and seconded to table. I just wanted to also point out that Ed Maddox is on the line if anybody had any questions for him this evening. Yeah, I, I would like to hear from him. And, and I know Jan and I, we did speak briefly about this, but I had kind of looked it over uh, before. And I mean, they had a planned commission meeting and it wasn't any. 
it, it wasn't, it was someone that had some questions, but they didn't say what the questions were. And I, uh, I don't know if Mr. Tory was there. Hold on, Terry. Are you going to withdraw your motion? No, no I got a table on the floor here. No more discussion. You got to hold on the table before we discuss okay. it further. It's in motion and seconded to table, Councilman Mel 44-21, Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Turk. I'm gonna vote no to hear the petitioner. Councilwoman Gavin. I'd like to hear petitioner too, so I'll vote no. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Landy. Aye. Councilman Morris. I'd like to hear the petition. I vote no. Councilman Mudrin. No. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Mayor Odekirk. Well, if the issue is is notifying residents. I guess we can ask them that question, but um, I, I don't think we're going to move forward if residents weren't properly notified. So I will vote no, and let's hear what he, Mr. Maddox has to say. Okay, so the motion failed. Is he uh, on the line? Mr. IT? He's on the line. Mr. Maddox? Hello. Hi, Hello. this. Edward Maddox. Okay, we have mayor and council here. Hello. Yes. Ms. Maddox, there was a question about uh, notification of the residents. Gina, you want to ask the question? Uh, Ed? Cynthia said she asked you to send email, or not emails, but regular mail to all the residents in that subdivision because they're older folks. They don't do the computer, they don't do the Zoom meetings, and she asked you to do that, and you did not do that. Why? Well, uh, just, just so, so I can you know, explain exactly how what I understood is that we had the meeting with the HOA. Uh, the people, you know, nine or ten people were there. Uh, there was no one in. Um, against or in opposition to the development. We had all positive things, a very successful development that we've had. Uh, we didn't know that there was any other obligation or anything else that they would want. Now, this is only a preliminary plat approval. So if there's something or, or, or an issue that you'd want us to do in addition, uh, as far as communication, we'd be glad to do that. Uh, between now and the time that we come back to the final, final plat, but you know, this is a union project that has been, you know, we're trying to get things and keep things moving. We pay, you know, a lot of money in permits and, and we employ a lot of people and to work. And so it's just to table it, I, I would hope that you'd reconsider and, and at least if, if there's a request that you want us to send some kind of a mailing or something, we would do that. We did have the management of the HOA. We had the president of the, of the master association. We had the president of the condo association. Uh, we don't know of any issue uh, up until this moment. Uh, we had unanimous, unanimous excuse me, Ed, from the Ed, Ed, excuse me, Ed, excuse me. The president of the HOA said she cannot talk for all the people there, and she asked you personally to send mails, registered mails, to all the homeowners there because they don't get email because they have a lot of older folks that live okay. in that subdivision. Now, you bring this on yourself. You I, and I, I have been happy. going after this for years. You don't notify the people that live there and then we have to fight with you to get you to talk to them or have a meeting. And you did have a meeting, but you only had not, everybody had access to the meeting due to COVID and they don't have, they're not computer savvy. So you brought this on yourself because okay. you could have sent that email or not the email, excuse me. You could have sent those letters back in November and or December, but you didn't. And, 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 and Jan, quite honestly, we, we would have been so glad to do such a thing. We were not aware of this until this evening, but there's a lot of time between now and the time we have to come back for a final plan. So we would be allowed to at least not stop the project, but we will fulfill this requirement and anything else that would maybe be asked to go ahead and put out registered letters, whatever kind of letters anyone would want. This is the first I'm hearing of it as far as that they wanted it. And, and I, I was in the meeting, and, and, and so was the, the management. I got a I got communication from the manager of the HOA saying that everyone was in in, in uh, um, the nine people nine, that were there were okay with it, so but they did I, not I want to speak I, for everyone there. Complicated or difficult. Go ahead, please. But 
So I, I would just respectfully like to request that we will comply with whatever Jan or the this um, uh, HOA person has got to say as far as if it's just a, a matter of putting out a letter, uh, we, we'll, we'll do that immediately. Uh, and between now and the time this would come back and before you, which would be a couple months yet anyway, for a final plat. And if there's issues at that time, then we can table it if there was. But quite, I mean, I've built it for 30 years in Joliet. We, we build great things. It's a very successful development. I would hope that you just not slow it down or stop it. Are there any other questions for Mr. Maddox? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Is there a motion for Council Memo 44-21, which are ordinances associated with Timber Oaks Unit 3 subdivision? Based on Mr. Maddox's explanation, I'd, I'd make that motion. And I'll second that. I heard his explanation, so. It's been motion and seconded to approve Council Memo 44-21, which are ordinances associated with Timber Oaks Unit 3 subdivision. This includes an ordinance approving the preliminary planned unit development for Timber Oaks Unit 3, an ordinance approving the reclassification of six acres at the southeast corner of Timber Ridge Court and Southeast Frontage Road from B3 General Business and I1 Light Industrial to R4 Low Density Multifamily Residential Zoning, an ordinance approving the vacation of a 10-foot sanitary sewer easement, a 10-foot stormwater detention easement, and a 15-foot drainage and utility easement located at the southeast corner of Timber Ridge Court and Southeast Frontage Road. Mr. Mayor. Yes. So as Jan had spoke about, so is there something in there that Mr. Maddox would be, be obligated to reach out to every single resident within? I thought it was within so many feet that, that that he needs to send a letter out before this comes back, the final comes back to us. Mm -mm. That's only for me Jim. to choose. So we could add a condition to the uh, preliminary, pl the preliminary PUD ordinance um, requiring that, that, that letters go out um, they are following, they, they did file for their final PUD for February plan commission. And then that would come back to you in, in March. So we can monitor that, um, you know, and he can maybe provide us with all those addresses that uh, you want letters sent to. And um, we can, again, monitor that to make sure it's done. Uh, but they did file last Friday for the final PUD. Do we need another motion then if we're going to modify this? You should amend the motion to put this condition in it. Correct, Sabrina? So moved. Well, I guess my go. question is for Jim. Are you saying that, I guess, can you clarify what you mean in terms of monitoring? Um, what, what will your it, department do? Will you make it part of the, the requirement before it can be brought back to the commission? To the plan commission? I mean, as best uh, as we can, yes. Uh, I mean, but if it was a condition of the plan unit development ordinance, then it would be a requirement of him, of Mr. Maddox to to do that based on the ordinance. Otherwise, we would just monitor it, um, you know, and, and I don't believe we're required to bring it back, you know, unless we're happy with the uh, terms of, you know, the approval. Okay, uh, then I would amend the motion. I, I have one other question. So, is he, so he would have to do this certified mail to the residents? So, I mean, what, what is going to be the, the proof to us that the letters went out, that the people, if the, and what the letter says, and is there going to be a response? Is the response go back to Mr. Maddox, or will it come to your department, or to, you know, I mean, what, what's the letter going to, you know? I guess we could work with him on that. Um, you know, we, I did hear him say, and you know, and, he, and maybe you want to follow up with him, but uh, I understood him to say that he would do certified letters um, if that was, you know, what you uh, wanted. Um, we can work with him on the, the letter, um, what's 
put in the letter and put my contact information in there if they have questions or concerns and then I can document that rather than those questions going back to the developer okay. you know we we send out letters as you know yeah. and, and you know my telephone number is put on there as as the planner involved. question there how many people live in that subdivision how many um condo or townhouse owners are there that's a good question um you know uh, i know this is just a small scale Proposal 48, so there's probably, I don't know, five times that. Uh, 200, 250? Yeah. And nine showed up to the Zoom meeting? That's my understanding. So the response to any certified letter to the remaining apparently senior type residents who aren't computer savvy could change vote. I can't, I, I'm just going to let you, I can't vote yes for something before I, I every, I, you know, um, resident has an opportunity to respond. Um, and I think we should all consider that. I mean, I, I protect my residents, like asking a lot of questions and make sure that they have a, you know, a response before I make the vote. And I think we should do the same. The tabling's looking awfully good again. Well, that's not to say that they weren't notified. The HOA should have notified them. It's not that they weren't given any notification. I don't know if they were or not, but they had an HOA meeting. I'm sure the president of the HOA just didn't call nine people and say, get on the phone. Right, but Terry, wouldn't you say it's not the HOA's, these volunteers' responsibility to do the due diligence of the well, No, no, it's not. I mean, but I'm still, I'm just saying now that he, you know, he has the condition before he comes back in, in March to, to um, notify, you know, everyone by certified mail, and they can, if they have any questions, they can call Mr. Tory. Terry. Terry? Yes, I'm here. Okay. She asked them that night to send the e or not the email, I keep saying that, to send the letters out to the homeowners in November when they had this meeting because not everybody has access to Zoom. That's why I said it could have been done then. But he said, oh, you want me to send something by snail mail? That was her quote, not mine, that he said to her. I was not at that meeting, but she we've been working with these folks for five years, Terry, you and I have, and it's always been some type of obstacle with Mr. Maddox. So to me, that would have been a simple request, but then the homeowner, not the homeowner, but the management guy sends a letter to us, says they had a homeowner's meeting, everything was fine, no one complained. Well, there's more than nine homeowners in that little subdivision, and I would like to hear from all of them, but he didn't do what she asked. And that's my problem right now. This could have been all averted and we would have had the good answers from all the people if they had a problem with it or not. And the other issue was the, the debris from the construction and where are they going to be parking all this heavy equipment because the last time it's a problem because there's only two ways in and out of that little subdivision. It sits over there on front and row behind the old Elks Club. And there's equipment there already, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's parked on a vacant lot. I drive by it every day. So yes. I don't know who's complaining, but the equipment's already there. It's not, it's, I, I see the equipment every day. It's off to the side on an empty lot. It, there's about 10 or 12 graders and, and, and loaders and it's there. So the equipment's on site. Uh, but once they start construction, they move around through the neighborhood and they just park on their little tiny street. You should go through that little subdivision. Yeah, no, anyway, I, I, mean, just, it was I, just, I, 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 don't know. I don't drive through there, and I think uh, there's lots of little condos back there, and I think what he's trying to do is put them now on, right on the front of the road, is what I'm thinking. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if he notifies everybody by letter, like he said he would do, uh, and he can't go forward unless we approve it in March, uh, I don't see stopping any preliminary work as long as by what he said he would do and let them get rolling, you know, I mean, there's a, a, probably a need for entry-level homes in Joliet, uh, and I think they, what would you call that entry-level home, Jen? Mr. Landy, there's a, his, there's a history, there's a history here with this man, okay, we've been dealing with this for five years, and it keeps changing, the original, the original thing was what, all condos, to, to Jim, the original plat five years ago was all condominiums, correct? He, uh, and single-family homes. He went back and forth between condo and right. apartments 
right. multiple times with with the original proposal. Exactly, it kept changing, changing, changing. There was nothing but problems right. for these they, issues. What are they now? Condos or apartments? What are they? I believe they're all condos in there. Well, uh, he, there's no apartments back there. All condos, right? Yes. But had, there were areas approval. for senior for single family homes. There was ingress and egress to build single family, and he abandoned that way many years ago. Yeah. When this whole thing started, I just, I just drive by there every day and I see just these, and these very simple, very. I mean, they're not they're they're not unattractive. Uh, they're just what I would call an entry level <coughs> condo. I think they're very reasonably priced. But he's not building condos now; they're apartments. Oh, now they're they want they want apartments. He's getting apartments. These forty-eight units are being proposed as apartments. Now it should be noted that they all have their own entrances. They all have their own laundry rooms, so. They function as a townhome, but they'll all be rented. And the complaints are coming, Jan, from the people that own the condos now? Yes, they have been for the last five years. Because okay. when folks bought those condos, they thought there were going to be single family homes around them. And that <coughs> didn't happen. So this lady, I've been dealing with her, and she, you know, a lot of people have already moved out of there because of what's been happening there with the, with the switch. That single family and condos. A lot of the condo homeowners have sold and left because they've had nothing but issues with this particular <coughs> builder. And I'm only representing the people that call me. That's my job, represent the citizens that live over there. They've been calling me. I've been working with them for five years, and Terry and I have had several meetings out there, and he knows the drill. So to not do what this lady asked, to just send the letter back in November, to the residents that were unable to attend is beyond me. This he brought this on himself again. Well, well, that's, right. why, well that's why he's going to send a letter now, mm -hmm. certified and. Yeah, but look at all the trouble we had to go through, Terry, well, just gonna, to get him to send a letter. We're going to move forward. Can you call the question on this? So the, it was down. motion and seconded, but if. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, Jim, this is the preliminary plat, and and is Mr. Mannix correct in saying that if he, if we, it does not bind us to if it comes out affirmative to a vote affirmative in March, correct? No, it does not, uh, you know. Um, so if, if he doesn't, okay, go ahead. Yes, and, you know, he's filed to go to the plan, uh, you know, which is the public hearing. Uh, I don't think there's any um, requirement of ours to bring it to city council until he's satisfied all these requirements of notifying all the adjacent residents and so forth so I think we wouldn't bring the final to City Council without that you know being done you know okay. I, I can assure you of that and uh, we would work with him on the letter if that's what you choose to do okay thank you mayor yes I feel like it councilman Morris asked a good question so okay you're gonna send the letter what's more important I think is the response from you know, we're talking about nine people showed up to the Zoom meeting and there's 200 to 250 property owners. Heck, those nine people could be four couples, could be only four property owners, a husband and a wife. How are we going to know how they feel as a council? I think you were kind of asking that earlier, Terry, about how the feedback was going to get back to City. Right, and he, he said he's going to put his contact yeah. information on there. Mr. Tory did. We could put my contact information on Mr. Maddox's letters going out so any concerns could come back to me if that's again what you choose thank would you. they have a chance at public hearing to voice their objections to it the public hearing there would be the final pud would go to plan commission which would be the public hearing and they would make recommendation again to come to city council in march but or, again with COVID, it's making it very difficult that's why they didn't go to the meeting in the first place that's probably true so it was motion and seconded to approve council memo 44-21 um, ordinances associated with timber oaks unit three subdivision based on discussion if you wanted to add the requirement to notify um, the residents of timber oaks subdivision you would need to uh, amend the motion to add that stipulation i would amend my motion i would second so it's been motion and seconded to approve Council Memo 44-21, ordinances associated with Timber Oaks Unit 3 subdivision with the requirement that the developer mail notification of project to its uh, residents of Timber Oaks subdivision. Councilman Turk. Aye. 
Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? No. Councilman Landy? With the stipulation that he has to write the letters and the letters are gonna be reviewed by the committee uh, and we have the right in March to still not issue a permit, I'll say aye. Do I understand it correctly? Yes. You know, as long as I understand it correctly, that he, you know, there, he has to do all that and still come before us in March, right? Yes. Then I'll say aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? No. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. <coughs> Motion carried. 6-2. Moving on to Council Memo 45-21. Ordinance declaring certain properties as public nuisances. It's recommended said ordinance be adopted. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Council you are the last party in the conference. Councilman You Tur will hear silence Tur until the conference begins. Councilman Turner? Line muted. Me? What yes. is that? Aye. Uh -huh. Motion carried. <laughs> Council Memo 46-21, ordinances associated with Ketone Business Center Subdivision. This includes an ordinance approving the revised preliminary plat of Ketone Business Center Subdivision, an ordinance approving the final plat of Ketone Business Center Subdivision Unit 3, and an ordinance approving the recording plat of Ketone Business Center Subdivision Unit 3. It's recommended said ordinances be adopted. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Motion carried. Under resolutions, Council Memo 48-21, a resolution authorizing the submittal of the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It's recommended said resolution be adopted. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 49-21, resolution appropriating motor fuel tax funds for the 2019 MFT roadways resurfacing contract B in the amount of $36,114.19. It's recommended said resolution be adopted. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 50-21, a resolution to include cash payments related to health insurance as IMRF earnings. It's recommended said resolution be adopted. I'll move. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Quick question, Mayor. Can someone, ex what, what are we doing here exactly now? I mean, I've read the memo. What, what, what is this? Is uh, Jim Gadotti here tonight? I don't believe so. Maybe table it to the next one. The, the, way he, the way he explained it, IMRF now allows, or now, if, if an employee opts out of our insurance program and goes on their spouses, we give them a, a, a certain amount of money, I don't know what that is, to, to not take our insurance. And that is now, IMR, that they, they consider that now credible earnings for IMRF, whatever that portion is. He may be in his office, so we don't mind just- Well, we'll, we'll move on if, then if, if he wants if to come. I, if, I, if I can, Mayor, I, 
uh, and council members. I know that, that the uh, offer for not taking insurance is $200 uh, if, if you don't take insurance for an employee. Uh, if you take insurance, it's, it's what it is. But what they're saying is, is that then your retirement would be based on that additional income of $200 a month. Is that taxable income when, we, when you take that option? Uh, I would believe so. I yes, believe it, it is. is. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. And is taxable income? Yes. So there's, there's, oh, here's, here's Mr. Gaddaddy uh, right now. Um, so. Jim, I've only got one quick question. Yes, sir. The $200 a month when you opt out of insurance? Correct. Is that taxable income then? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, that's all I needed. Can you clarified it for me, Mike. Mm -hmm. This motion and seconded to approve Council Memo 50-21, which is a resolution to include cash payments related to health insurance as IMRF earnings. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Fullman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Motion carried. Under bids and contracts, award of contracts, Council Memo 52-21, award of contract for the Well Rock One Rehabilitation Project to Fahoy Group in the amount of $253,729. Council Memo 53-21, Professional Engineering Services Agreement for the Auxable Wastewater Treatment Plant Screening Improvements to Donahue and Associates in the amount of $42,500. Council Memo 54-21, Award of Contract for Managed Print Services. Council Memo 55-21, Award of Contract for the Oxable Wastewater Treatment Plant Device Net Upgrade to Wonderlick Malik in the amount of $58,800. Council Memo 56-21, Amended Award of Contract to the Forest Park Phase Two Water Main Improvements Project to Austin Tyler Construction in the amount of $1,489,133.50. Council Memo 57-21, Award of Contracts for Information Technology Professional Services. It's recommended Council Memos 52-21 through 57-21 be approved. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turf? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Motion carried. Under amendments, change orders, and payments, Council Memo 58 21, change order number two in the amount of $36,114.19 and payment request number five and final in the amount of $100,100.89 for the 2019 roadways resurfacing contract B to Austin Tyler Construction. Council Memo 59-21, change order number two for the GPS AVL professional services contract to Skyhawk Telematics in the amount of $11,000 $142. And Council Memo 60-21, change order number one for the Rock Run Water Tower Reconditioning Project to Era Valdivia Contractors in the amount of $9,350. It's recommended Council Memos 58-21 through 60-21 be approved. Second. Been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Motion carried. Next is the city manager's report. Hi. I just want to give you a quick overview. This has only been my first uh, week here in the job. So as I've gotten to know the staff, I've uh, asked them to uh, provide some information on, on the way we're gonna do business going forward. I've provided you all copies of that. So I, I'd like you to take a look at those uh, items and uh, I'd like some feedback as to if you think that that's too much information, not enough information. Uh, and is that something we'd like to put on the, 
on the website for, for, for citizens to look at uh, so they know what, what you kind of know. Uh, you will, we will redact some of the confidential information that, that may be on there. But uh, if, if, so I'd like your feedback. If you think it's a good idea, if you don't think it's a good idea, please call me, let me know, and we can move back around. But I, I appreciate any feedback you, done, you, you can give me. Uh, the staff has done a tremendous job putting this together for us and the format that it's in. So if you please take a look at that and see if that's something you, that you agree with uh, going forward is the way we, we start to do our staff work. I'd certainly appreciate it. So that, that concludes my report. Next is new business, not for final action or recommendation. Terry? Yep. Terry? Jim? Nope. Mike? Sure? Nope. Ed? I do. Here. I'd like to talk on Southland Water Agency. I have talked to our city manager, Jim Caparello, on this uh, over the weekend, and I've talked to uh, Alice Switzer on this numerous times, who sent me a number of reports that they have extensively looked at this earlier to the tune of about 105 pages. Um, a number of us have been contacted by these people and asked that a third option may make sense as a credible look at what's going on. I ask that we consider to delay what may be, what will be, our most important decision the council has ever made for a short period of time so that we can complicate can, can under, so we can understand the three options and can make the, a fully informed decision. Examine the contents and specific of the Southland proposal, a type of a hybrid that might or might not work. Could it be our best option? For instance, it would look like the city would have a few other options. We would be allowed to get to the lake 15 miles closer. We would eliminate the need for Joliet to purchase or, re or lease property in Indiana. It could reduce our capital costs by $323 million. We could share some long-term O&M costs of about $250 million. Is all of this for real? I don't know. I think we need to get Southland and our staff and consultants together to see if there's anything viable in this. What I do know is the EPA last week put the city of Joliet on a wait list for $441 million in federal financing for this alternate water source, which is outstanding. At the same, same time, they put Southland Water Agency on the exact same list for $701 million. For these reasons, I think we should hit the pause button and take a better look at this. With a new city manager who has been on the job only a few days, this will let him spend some more time on the issue and he'll have a chance to digest all the information. There's much at stake. I don't want to rush into anything. We actually had the opportunity to do this right. Thanks for your time. And I believe there is a Southland representative uh, here. All right, Sherry? Uh, no. Betty? Uh, no. Okay. I have a couple things. Um, number one, I think uh, Chief Lasker, Deputy Chief Carrier here, and Jim, this would be directed towards you. What is the status of, uh, if, if you know, the vaccine program here in Will County? I know our fire department is ready to step up and help. Could you give the council kind of an overview and, and update where we're at with this? Certainly. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council, City Manager. Um, the news is we don't know the news. Uh, we've been waiting for a plan from the Will County Health Department for some time, um, and we have yet to get a defined plan of how we're moving forward. Um, currently, we are in the 1A status and we are supposed to, by the governor's decree, move to 1B by the 25th of this month, which is next Monday. 
Uh, we were told recently, Chief Kerry got a correspondence from his contact there that uh, they're, the Will County Health Department is, is certainly not prepared to move forward with 1B for at least another month. Uh, what we're looking to do is, is we're looking to be part of this. We want to participate. We want to assist. Uh, we've already spoken with, with the schools. Um, Joliet West has partnered with us to offer up their field house for up for two months where we can begin to give immunizations. And we're not just looking at student, or excuse me, we're not just looking at our people, we're also looking at the teachers, we're also looking at that next group of 1B, which is the group of 65 plus that we feel that need to be vaccinated as well. The key is we feel we just need to move forward. Uh, we don't feel it's moving as quickly as we would like. And um, we'd, we'd, be like to, we'd like to be part of the process to help move forward. And we're, we're here to offer our assistance. But, and, you know, I, I don't know what we can do. What, what do you need from the council of the city manager? Um, we'd, uh, if there's anything we can do to help with the, the county move forward with their process, if you could have some discussions with those at the health department to help move this forward, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Councilman Coleman, I know you've also been on top of this issue. Do you have anything to add to this? It's just tough getting through. The, no one will return phone calls there, except for one person, a PR person, Mr. Brandy. And um, you can't take it any further than that because he's just the PR guy. He was, was on the radio last week asking for uh, people to volunteer, lay people. They would teach them how to give shots. and. You know, they were looking for areas to have this in, but, uh, you know, we've already been in place for over a month, which I didn't know, and I found out by accident just by volunteering to give the shots. So uh, I've made several phone calls to no avail to other folks with no return calls. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in so, actuality, yeah. this, this became one of the very first issues on, on, on that Monday when I came into work. Uh, I've been working with Chief Blasky I, I, and um, Deputy Chief Carey, who has done tremendous work staffing this and getting this prepared and partnering with uh, various stakeholders, but I have not been able to get a hold of anybody in the county who is a decision maker that can tell us anything in, in terms of do they have the vaccines, are they ready to be released. I think this, this is a really important uh, thing that needs to be done, uh, people's lives are at stake here and if they have vaccines let's let's just start vaccinating people and getting them out there uh we're ready to execute we just need the uh, the product so they don't need to do anything else except if you can get that to us we'll start vaccinating people the sooner we get cracking on this the sooner we can get people vaccinated especially uh city workers i mean one of the the great points the chief had made in a private meeting with me is you know we have snowplow workers that you know, our, if we get a big snow and they're all out with COVID, well, who's plowing the streets? So those are the kinds of issues that we need to, to think about uh, here as, as we have those vaccines so that we can get those out. It's just not police officers, just not firefighters uh, and EMS personnel, but there are critical city workers that need to be vaccinated. And again, the, 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 well, the fire department's more than ready to go. And also seniors and people at risk. Yes, but absolutely. Mayor. So, real quick, is there a shelf life on these vaccines? Um, once, the, once they're thought out there as a shelf, we have any vaccines on hand right now, we haven't been given that, that information. And again, we're not looking to overstep the county. They would still have to maintain a level of scheduling and tracking on this information and for all of the individuals that want to be vaccinated. We're just, we just want to be, um, be there to help administer it, to help move this along faster. Chief, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Now, the first dose has been made available to firemen already, has it not? It has because we are listed as EMS workers, so we fell into that 1A group. So the vast majority, minus a few, have already received both their first and second doses. Okay, so the second dose has been available? It has. We've, because Chief and I have already had our second that, doses. The first dose available, but if you don't have the second dose within 21 days, the first dose is, is uh, void anyways, right? You have, you have to have both. That's correct. And Okay, because I was under the understanding that the second dose was not available yet, but you're saying it is available. I don't know that it's available, but I would like to know some information for those that are going to receive it. If you 21 them. days and don't have the second dose, the first dose is no good. There's no limit on the second dose. There's a minimum. You can't get it 17 days before, but you can... You can get the second dose 
six months from now. There is no maximum on that. But they they want dose, you to get it within that because they want you to get that 95% as quick as okay. possible. So the first dose is not 95%? No, you're about 50% about a week or two after the first dose. Okay, all right. So and you get the 95% two weeks after the second dose. They're saying there is no maximum on that, so you can get it three months later and you'll still be fine. You don't have to restart the process. And the one available to us is Pfizer, there's Pfizer and... Uh, Moderna. Moderna? Yes. And which do we have? There's both. We, we've received Pfizer, because that's what the hospitals have. The county now has given out Moderna. Moderna is uh, 28 days. And no one has had an adverse reaction? Because uh, I've always heard there's a possibility of a reaction to the shot as well. We have not had a, any incidents of that? We had normal side effects ever. About 30% of the firemen, after their second dose, did have like the flu-like symptoms for about 24 hours, and that was it. And that's to be expected. So that, that fell right in line with the trials. Nothing serious. Nothing serious. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I feel like it's a twilight zone. I got some questions. Number one is my understanding. Of course, there's a lot of information from the CDC. In other words, I believe, and you guys could probably confirm this, the shelf life after thawing is five days, is what my understanding is. Yeah. Um, so, Councilwoman Quillman, nobody from the county other than the public relations officer has gotten back with you yet. I've only talked to him, only spoke to him because I've been dealing, I'm talking with um, Chief Blasky and Deputy Chief Carey. But it's my understanding that no one's calling okay. you folks back. Is that not correct? And Mr. Yeah. Caparelli? And, and I did get some information last week that we'd be getting a packet in the mail okay. for how to distribute. They were going to get it. I was going to get it. Uh, Mr. Caparelli was going to well, get it. Well, I want to address my concern here. Mr. Caparelli, your quote was, you haven't heard from any decision makers yet. No, I, we have not heard from any decision makers yet. Uh, so, uh, again, I'm not trying to point fingers. I'm just trying to get a hold of the vaccine so we can okay. get the firefighters. So and I don't want to cause it or pick that fight. No, no, I, they I don't have them. Right, exactly. I just need an answer to my question. Let's just get them. I just needed an answer to my question to go yes, in my sir. direction. Absolutely, yes, sir. And you've not been contacted by anybody, including the county exec's office? That's correct. Now, on the way here, I think Betty and Terry can tell you, I was about, what, eight, ten minutes late, guys? I was listening to WJL's news where it said the county exec has been reaching out to fire departments. Where's this disconnect? <laughs> you've not heard from them. It was yeah. on the JOL news. I have not heard from the exec. I have not heard from the executive either. I did have a meeting with the executive over water last week, and we talked about it, uh, but not in great detail. So I did speak with her once about it. It's an interesting news item. It was presented as the, the county executive office is reaching out to fire departments and other individuals that would be, you know, allied to. And, and, and I, Chief, I believe you. I just want to know where the disconnect is on getting this done during such a, a critical time to the pandemic. So what's our next step? Oh, wait, we gotta maybe, do more than just talk about it. Maybe she's referring to Mr. Brandy going on the radio last week asking for, for people to come and do this. <sighs> okay, let me just explain this really quick. So I called Mr. Blasky, Chief Blasky, and I said, well, or, and uh, asked Caparelli, Mr. Caparelli, I said, wouldn't this be great? Let's get our fire department involved. And let's get this done so we can get the shots in the arms. He tells me, Jan, we've already been doing this. Mr. Brady didn't know that, but they've been ready since went back in December, December 31st, when I looked at some of the emails that were sent to me. Is that not correct? Yeah, I, we started talking with St. Joe's December 29th. He okay. asked the volunteers. We asked the unions. The unions were overwhelmingly yes in support of volunteering their time to give the vaccination. And, and that's how I got involved. And then I found out we're already doing it. And that's when I called Mr. Brady and I said, well, what's going on? Because Jolie, that's ready to go. And he said he didn't know. I'm just and trying to figure out. I understand what you're saying. So we've been, been back and forth and back and forth. Our chief shouldn't have to hear it on the radio as, as, as a, a, a casting call. The, you know, we're the, third, we're the largest city in the, in the county. Somebody needs to But they've been doing it before they were even on the radio asking for it is what my, I'm saying. My daughter is going to USF studying nursing. She's in her third year. She was one of a, a team that was organized through USF. Gave a thousand vaccines in New Lenox about a week ago to special needs individuals. So somebody knows how to organize it. Well, while we use this as a call, then we're officially requesting the county to contact Chief Blasky, myself, or uh, City Manager Jim Caparelli tomorrow, and we'll put this together and hopefully have an announcement by tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. Mayor, I couldn't agree more. Again, uh, the fire department is more than ready to. We have a distribution plan in place. We just don't have the product. 
Very good. All right, we'll follow up. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the second issue, um, and I'm curious to see what's going to happen in Naperville tonight. Apparently, um, Naperville has on their agenda a, a resolution to request the governor not to sign the, um, I don't even know what to call it, the crime bill or the law enforcement bill that was passed in Springfield a week, about a week ago. Um, I haven't read the whole bill. I've read a, a, about a 15-page synopsis of the bill, and I'm not sure exactly what Naperville, the language of what they're voting on. I, I have a call on the mayor of Jericho, but I did not hear from him. I can tell you from what I read, I, there, I, there's uh, items that probably make sense. There's some items that don't make any sense. And I don't know how anyone could believe that our communities are going to be safer with some of the provisions that were passed at Springfield. So it's something I would like to take a look at um, in deeper, Jim and Sabrina, and possibly, I know we're meeting next week uh, for the water. I, maybe we should put this on the, um, but I also want to follow up with Naperville and see exactly what the language was there. All right, Mayor, we'll, we'll get in touch with them and uh, take a look at their what they're doing and if we can mirror that uh, so that we speak with one voice uh, to the governor, and I think that would be helpful. Okay, thank, thank you. you. That's all I have. Next is public comments. First is Wayne Horn. Conference will automatically end in five minutes. We're not going to do this anymore going forward. This will be the last night of this. So I, we have... I don't know what the problem is, why we keep getting interrupted. I'm uncertain of that as well. Right. Wayne Horn. Okay, thank you. We had several people sign up to speak. However, when I walked in the room behind, there is no one here that is w wanting to speak this evening. Okay. So, um, and then we had um, Mr. Sheridan. Could you at least call the names out? Yes. Thank you. Wayne Horn, Mr. Sanchez, Mr. Baragan, and Jerry Hervey. And Mr. Sheridan did sign up to be called to speak, but he is no longer on the line. It was notified. Okay. So with no other public comments, we'll move on to mayor and council comments. Terry? Nothing, yeah. Larry? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. <clears throat> Mike? Nothing. Herb? Yeah. No. Cherry? Nothing. Eddie? Yeah, just, uh, <clears throat> just a little quick uh, comment. I want to thank the uh, leadership of the JPD uh, with the, um, they we breaking all kind of, setting all kind of records now, female in leadership, so I'm, I'm rah rah for that. Uh, Don, I know you'll do a good job. I just hope that you're able to do that. Uh, and let's get it going where we're getting the uh, the community involved and, and get back on track. I think you have uh, some great people around you. Uh, to the outgoing uh, JPD leadership, uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude. This city does, so I thank you for your service on that. So that is my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know Mr. Trisna is here. If I could read this into the record, because um, this would be the last meeting he's going to attend as a Joliet employee. Um, and that's on his own volition. <laughs> um, Jim Trisna was hired on March 23rd, 1987, as a civil engineer one in the Public Services Department of the Design and Construction Division. Uh, public services soon became public works and utilities within the engineering division. In February 1992, Jim was promoted to Public Works Administrator, where he remained until November of 2006, where Jim was again promoted to the Director of Public Works, which is where he has served up until today. So, Jim, I know you're, you're, you have a pending retirement. Um, I, I'll give you the floor, and I think we're, we have some comments for you. Chair. Sure. 
You, you guys can go first if you like. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, I, will, I, I want to thank you no for problem. your service. You, you've done a great job. Certainly been a great assistance to me as mayor. Um, besides the day-to-day -day operations, I think your role in the whole Boat Road Bridge project, especially early on, was crucial. So thank you for all your hard work, for your input. We do appreciate the great job you've done. Thank you. Jim, I'd just like to say thank you. You have been a great um, uh, mentor for me and asset for me as I came in. Uh, you were very open and, and helped me a lot. I tried to cancel your retirement, but your wife didn't go for it either, so I lost out on that end. But Jim, you know, best of luck to you in your retirement, and the city is going to really miss you, man. We're going to really miss you. Thank you. Jim, this is Jan. We're here. <laughs> I said, right here. We've worked together for many years, and uh, I could always call you when we had an issue or a constituent had an issue, and you'd call them for me and get back to me. And they always said, what a gentleman that Conference you were. Conference will automatically end in 30 seconds. What a gentleman you were and very kind and always tried to help them solve their issues. So good luck to you and your new adventure, and uh, you will certainly be missed. And I also want to wish you good health. And remember, when you're retired, every day Saturday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Jim, on behalf of the citizens of Joliet, who Conference not, ending. Goodbye. May not know everything you've done. Uh, I appreciate it. I've known you, obviously, for a lot of years, way before you were a professional down here. So thanks for everything, and good luck in retirement. Thanks. Jim, I just want to say thanks. Um, I've known you a long time, and uh, you're a person of high integrity and, and a good good character. And uh, those absolutely sh uh, shown through in your performance and to citizens of Joliet. But I especially want to thank you for helping me do my job and uh, responding to the residents and, and calling you. And uh, you're always there to, to, to help out and uh, give us the right answer. So thank you, and good luck. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Jim, I haven't known you as long as most of these guys, but it's been an absolute pleasure for the amount of time I have known you. You've always been responsive, helped me with any problems I had when any resident needed help, and, you know, that's what we're here for, and that's what you are obviously there for, and I appreciate it all, and I congratulate you on being a quitter, and, uh, <laughs> joking. Good environment. I hope you have, you know, a long, happy, healthy, uh, many years ahead of you of fun and enjoyment. Thanks. 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 Sure. Very good. Mm -hmm. Jim, thank you. You've you, uh, been a great you know, benefit for me personally uh, with the constituents and you, you've always been kind to them. You've come out, you know, at, 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 you know, at the drop of a hat, even after hours, you know, to uh, feel, you know, what they, what they desire and needs or to listen to him, he's very attentive and, and uh, very proud that you was, you know, employee of the city of Joliet. You really made the city look good. So, Jim, congratulations on your retirement and enjoy it. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Jim, mm. my question is, Crystal, why do you have Jim's son's picture up there? <laughs> <laughs> but, Pretty young then, huh, Larry? Wow. Yeah. That's, 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 does your son work for the city now, too? <laughs> Jim, I bet you. 2011 when I first came on. I've worked with you, especially quite a bit with public service sure. in the last four or five years, as well as economic development. Mm -hmm. And we've worked together on a lot of a lot of things, a lot of projects. Um, and I echo what everybody said. Of course, you've always been re re responsive. You, you, you've always gotten the job done. Um, but you've done it with the utmost of professionalism. So you are going to be missed on both the committees as well as by the city. Um, I know most uh, all of the citizens that we've worked with over the last 10 years. I'm gonna miss you too. Mm -hmm. I, I know that you've done a good job training, grooming, Greg Ruddy, my fake, my fake Triz. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so again, congratulations on your retirement and uh, you know, have some fun with your, your wife and family now. I will. Thanks okay. for your service. Thanks, yeah. um, if I could, I just a couple of things. Sure. Uh, I, I will say this, I've been here, when I leave, I'll, I'll be like one month short of 34 years in the city. Um, Kind of, kind of funny, I, I came to the city in 1987. It was my third job out of college. I got out of college in 1980. Figured, okay, I was in the private sector. Then I went over to the public sector for about two and three months. I worked for Will County Highway before I came here. 
And I thought, well, I'll probably be there a few years and move on. You know, that's just the way the world is. It's not like the days of our parents. You know, they worked at one place most of their life. Uh, obviously, I've enjoyed it. Um, so I'm 34 years, almost 34 years later, here I am, you know, retiring. So, um, but first of all, I'd like to say just thanks. Thanks to the people in the city of Joliet, you know, and every, everybody that, well, obviously, you guys were not in. Mike was here. Mike was here when I started. He was the only guy. I've been here so long. But, uh, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and work here. Um, I, the first job I had, I bounced around the country with a, with a big uh, in, in, international type company, Chicago Bridge and Iron, doing different type work, police steel work. And, um, and never really thought of coming back to my hometown. I'm from Joliet. I never thought I thought about doing this. But it turned out to be a really great experience. I mean, it was so nice for it's a lot of things I've been involved with. Uh, from when I first got here, we had the major road reconstruction program. The city had sold bonds, and I was a I started as a designer, as the mayor said. And you know, extending streets like Theodore, Ingalls. Ingalls didn't exist as it is today, from from Broadway all the way out to Essington. Um, Theodore, same way. We had a big gap on there. People were from the area. You know, you remember that. Um, streets like. Glenwood Avenue, that was one of my big projects, Glenwood and Essington. Essington, I had that section between Jefferson and, and Black Road, and it was an old county highway, open, big open ditches. You know, we made it, we made it a four-lane road. Um, I see Sherry shaking because she lives in that area. Um, Glenwood Avenue, again, didn't extend out, made another nice ambulance route to get into the city. So I started out with those kind of projects. The NIP program just got started. All of a sudden, the boats came to town, and, you know, my goodness, we went from a million and a half dollars in neighbor, neighbor improvement projects a year to seven and a half to ten million a year within well, neighborhood improvements projects, and that was a, that was a lot of fun to do too. I mean, there were so many parts of our town that were really lacking all the the 20th century amenities, and you know we were at the end of the 20th century and the start of the 21st century. So that was really nice. I and mean, I always say if we had about 10 more years, we'd have, we'd have finished the whole town. Um, you know, we came up a little short, unfortunately. The, the riverboat money died off, but the mayor and the council were always great giving our, our department more money to do projects with it. I really appreciate that. It was nice. Um, the population of the city doubled from when I was here. We started about 75,000, now we're just short of 150,000. Obviously, we had, all, we had all the growth since I've been involved in reviewing subdivision thing. That was, that was you know, a lot of, you know, it was, it was very time consuming, very intensive, but it was, it was great for the city. You know, the city, the city ended, didn't even go across 55 when I started here. Now we're out in Kendall County. Or as far east as you know, about a mile from the new the, the current Silver Cross Hospital. So I've seen a lot of growth. Obviously, the industrial growth came in the last 10, 12 years. Um, I jokingly call that that document. I still have my desk. I'm giving it to Greg Ruddy. I call it the Bible for Center Point. So whenever they come in and they try to change something, I say, "Wait a minute! Here, look at the, look at this page of the document." So you know, they they'll probably be happy that I'm leaving here soon, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. But yeah, I, I've seen a lot of nice things. It's been great. And like I say, hey, I'm just I, you know, I thank everybody, the people who I've worked for, all the you know. I've got a great group of engineers in my group that I've worked for, and that makes it all great. The street department, the fleet guys, everybody I've worked with, there's really a lot of good, hardworking people here in the city is all I'm getting at. So we're fortunate, the city's fortunate, and I can say thanks for, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Okay. There's no other comments. Next is um, we had a request for closed session. So is there a motion to go into closed session to discuss personnel, collective bargaining, land acquisition, or conveyance pending or threatened litigation after which the meeting will be adjourned? So moved. It's been motion and seconded to approve. Councilman Turk? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Landy? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Motion carried.